Okay, so um, let's see, we don't have class on Thursday. Let me get this launching while I'm talking. Um, then we have, we're back on Tuesday of next week. Now, next Wednesday is the Reformation, right? So there are no classes on Wednesday, but Thursday we're back. Okay, so our midterm is going to be next Thursday. So the day after Reformation. Um, uh, I'll spend a few minutes talking about it now, and then if you have questions on uh, Tuesday, uh, we can go over those. Um, so format for the midterm is going to be primarily um, kind of short answer essay e type questions. Um, there might be one, um, I guess, one or two programming questions on there, but it would be a fairly, uh, you know, since you're not going to be at a computer, it would be some fairly short thing. I might ask you, I might ask you to read one. And then maybe write a little something for another one. But, you know, the primary primary type questions would be something like, you know, the difference between the um, update and fixed update, you know, that type of thing. So kind of understanding, uh, um, you know, the different components of Unity. Uh, I might give you a scenario and ask you to give me a uh, kind of, a, you know, how you would solve this. It's like, oh, well, you know, I want I want these. Uh, um, you know, these when these two characters collide, something should, uh, uh, or when you know the player hits another guy, and he should he should die. How would you go about doing this? Put box colliders. The box colliders uh, hit. You might say the player is going to um, know when the uh, colliders impact with each other, and then the player is going to do the magic of killing off the other guy. Or you might you know go the other direction so the other guy knows how to kill himself you might decide you want to go with a scene manager type approach so there might be multiple correct answers to it but you know proving you kind of think through the problem solving of the the tools that we have in front of us um there'll probably be 10 questions my exams usually are 10 questions long uh each worth the same amount um any other high level questions it's going to be generally the format and it'll be in here, not in the computer lab. Uh, my plan is probably the final to be in the computer lab to create something, but we'll see if that actually ends up being a a thing <laughs> or, or, or not. Uh, we'll have to see if we can rely on the, the lab. Okay, so for today, we were supposed to uh, consume the power up and scale, right? So right now, what's our power up doing? So it should hit that guy, bounce back. So now we want the baby to collide with it and probably not have this happen. <laughs> All right, so upon collision, we want the... Uh, um, power up to go away, so it'll destroy itself, but also the baby become aware that the uh, power up has been destroyed and have an action associated with it, right? Um, so now for right now, here's our power up container. Here's the actual fire grass. Um, right now, that's, this guy is untagged. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna add a tag for power up. So we'll create a new tag. Call this guy power up. All right, then I'll go back to the fire grass and we'll mark this guy as a power up. All right, now we already see them colliding. So the, uh, um, the power up has a box collider 2D. The baby has a box collider on the baby. Um, so these two are already able to impact each other. We go into the baby movement script, which seems to be where we're putting all the logic for the baby right now. That isn't to say we couldn't have multiple scripts attached to the baby, but we've kind of thrown everything into this, uh, this one. Maybe we'll be a little bit more uh, component-based when we do our um, 
kind of legend or legend of Zelda type clone in the uh, second half. Now I'm hoping um, that unity releases the update um, probably before the, like the Tuesday after the, um, the midterm. So that's kind of when I want to shift over to kind of a different type of map based system. Uh, if they don't, uh, I'm going to use a, a different tool called tiled, but um the Unity 2017.2, uh, which is currently in beta, uh, is making kind of a big move in the direction of uh, 2D. They're including this tile map editor where you can eff effectively paint your uh, scene. So, you know, we've kind of created these, you know, platforms and stuff of like that. You would have been able to just draw a line. There's your platform. Uh, and you can say certain things are collidable, certain things are not, that kind of stuff. So, you know, if you wanted to have an entire area that was grass, you would, you know, kind of paint all around. You can select all and do a fill. And then the whole thing is grass and you can kind of draw in some water. And, you know, you're basically painting. And in the end, that's your map. Um, so it kind of makes level design a lot easier so you can start focusing more on gameplay type stuff. Uh, so I'm hoping they release that be, uh, before we move into that. But worst case, there are third party tools that effectively let you do the same thing. Um, the way tiled works is you get another application and you use that to do your painting. And then there's a tool that exports from the tiled, uh, format into unity and it effectively gives you a prefab. You just drop it in and that's your world that's your map so we'll see what we have but uh that should allow us to create some of that stuff all right so under baby movement uh we already have a collider deal okay so on collision enter 2d we are already asking the question what happens if we hit the floor let's throw an LSIF in here Collision dot game object dot tag is equal to power up. I think I had a lowercase p. All right. So if we're looking at a power up, we want a couple of things to happen. We want the uh, the power up to die. All right. So let's kind of start with that. So we're gonna go with um, that's what destroy. We're going to destroy collision.gameObject. All right, so let's just start with that. Make sure that we can get it to die off without it pushing us around too much. So now the baby becomes aware when he bumps into stuff. If he bumps into something of type power up, he kills it. Just, just gets it disappears. Ooh. All right, so that seemed to work okay. There was a little bit of interaction there. Um, so now we want the baby to also scale, huh? You still collide with it? Yeah, we collided. I know, but um, after destroy the object, I think whatever happened with me, I have to destroy the box collider, the render, and turn it off, and all that. I think I just messed up on destroy. Yeah, oh, so you're saying after we destroy it, are you still able to, is there still this invisible thing? <laughs> no, there shouldn't be. Because when you destroy the actual game object, all right, so that guy's gone. Oh. Yeah, there shouldn't be anything there. I wonder, did you just... Um, I'm going to take a guess here. Did you not destroy the game object? Did you destroy just the collision? I think I typed... I didn't write the script in uh, the play. I write the script in the background. Or I, I, so what did you do? You said destroy this? Yeah. I think yes. Yeah, so I, I think destroy the script. Yeah. And I did that too, and it wasn't working. Right. right. And I, I Google, and they're like, "This is the problem yeah. that people make." Yeah. Destroy right. You. Yeah. This that game object is the actual dude you need to kill. Okay. If you destroy this, that's the instance of the script that's attached to a game object. But that's when you start having to get the component that's the box collider, all these yeah, other individual the components. Yeah. If you just say this dot game object, that's the overall. That's the container that holds all of this. Wow. 
Uh, okay, so the baby will take whatever collided with it as long as it's a power up and go ahead and kill the game object associated with that collision. Now we also want the baby to go ahead and scale. Okay, um, and I think at the end of class last time, I um, mentioned that there's a, um, well, actually what we can do is we can set the, I mean, we can do this through scale. But we actually could just change the vector three associated with it. Let me look at something here real quick. Yeah, so we can use scale to increase the size of something by a certain amount, or we could just change the transform of this guy to be double what it currently is. So let's say vector two. Um, do need to be a little careful here from the perspective of if you hit more, more than one power up while your baby is already big, you probably want to keep a Boolean variable as to whether or not you're already big baby. <laughs> Otherwise, you become giant baby. <laughs> you just keep scaling up. Um, although, I guess the way we're going to probably write this is we're going to say uh, we want it to be wider and taller. So on the X and the um, the Y, right? So we're not messing with anything on Z. So if we take whatever it, um, well, we have a couple of options. We can take whatever it currently is and double it. If we do that, then the baby will always get bigger. With multiple power-ups or we can decide we can grab the initial values when the thing starts so we can say get rid of this for a second so up top here we can have a private float initial height and a private float initial width and then inside of start we can say this dot initial height is equal to this dot transform what is the I'm going to get the local scale of the transform. Is there not a normal scale? It's just local scale. Okay, so local score scale gives us the scale of the transform relative to its parent, which would work in this case. Otherwise, we have a thing called lossy scale that gives us the global scale of the object. Um, Local scale is what we want because the baby is relative to the scene itself. Lossy, in this case, local and lossy would give us the same, the same value. Um, but local gives us, if we have things inside of a parent, it gives you the size relative to the parent, which is actually good because then when a parent scales, things inside of it also scale, just like when a parent moves, other things uh, move along with it. So we'll grab the local scale, and this is the height, so dot y and then this dot initial width is equal to this dot transform dot local scale dot x so now we have those initial values so then when we hit a power up we can set the vector 2 to be just double those values You would think that like notifications wasn't double going to be two for your game? You were going to like run into Um, I thought we raised the. Oh no, that's right. We did one point five, right? We did ten and fifteen. Yeah, times one point five. 
All right, so we'll destroy the power up and then we'll say this dot transform dot local scale is equal to new vector two. This dot, so it's x, y, so this dot um, initial width times 1.5 and this dot initial height times 1.5. And does it want us to multiply that by 1.5f? To give us a float. Okay. Now, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to put another flag up here private bool um, is powered up we'll start that guy off at false and then down here when we increase our scale we'll also mark ourselves as being powered up this dot is powered up is equal to true Okay, so let's go back, test this. Well, I guess that makes sense because the um, all these are represented as vector threes, even though the z is one. Mm -hmm. So we just we just created a z of zero, effectively what it did. <clears throat> so change that to that. Change that to one f or add that to one F. Now we'll have a Z depth. So I guess that just made us flat or more than flat, <laughs> nothing. Oh no. <laughs> this baby's got to get up. We have some gravity issues here. Basically, like this whole game's on the moon. All right, there we go. Okay, so now when we think about Mario, we have a uh, uh, kind of two different kinds of power ups, right? We have the power ups that make you larger, and then how do you get smaller again? When you hit a hit an enemy, right? So if we go ahead and put one of our enemies back in, um, do we currently have a? An enemy in here that we just disappeared. It's just the uh... all right. So there's our enemy. Uh, we are going to have the issue here with uh, um, the power up hitting the enemy. Well, oh. oh, we don't have a box collider on the other guy. The other guy is uh, just set up to be. Well, no, he has to have a box collider. But is, is he a trigger? Yeah. All right. So right now, if we were this was Mario, when the baby hits uh, this guy, so we were we had some foresight there. We made this guy's box collider a trigger. What does a trigger do? How is a trigger different than um, I guess a, a non-trigger on a box collider or any other collider? When we click that box. Oh, yeah, I 
might stop this. It's not an important thing here. If I go to the enemy, we go to the box collider here. We look at, we have, is trigger checked? What does that do? This would be like a valid type of exam question. Ah, failed it. All right. So we, we effectively remove this guy from the game engine saying this is what physics does, right? So when we say it's a trigger, we're saying don't react to external stimuli using normal physics. Instead, just let whoever collides with this guy know that a collision has occurred and let him deal with it. OK, so because we haven't written any code in the power up or in this case in uh, the, the enemy to know that he's collided with stuff, the trigger gets triggered. The message gets thrown up. Nobody reacts to it. And the power up goes right through the guy. Right. There's no physics interaction because we've turned that off by saying is trigger. Does that make sense. So. That happened to be exactly what we wanted <laughs> in this case, so it kind of worked out. But now, in um, uh, right now, the way we have this set up, let me go ahead and power up again. So we'll grab our power up. This is a violent death. <laughs> I think we we had the death noise in there. Did we saw that other one playing. Yeah, was that the? I think it was like the laser fire, like but like all of them put together. <laughs> this is a horrible, horrible death. What we need is a baby screaming. <laughs> I was just, I was already thinking about like uh, if the baby shoots projectiles, you know, for like you know like a, some sort of attack. Because one of the power ups for Mario is like he becomes the fireball guy, right? Because the the the, the fire flower, yeah, and then he can shoot little fireballs. Well, what would the baby shoot? Kind of like a like a I was no see I was thinking the baby would actually like project a ghost like presence of itself. It's just it's like you know, just a shadow baby would fly out. I wonder who that is. It's the second time I've called today. It's a random uh, Florida number. Um, okay, so uh, um, yeah. Regardless, obviously that baby would shoot zombie shadow of itself. It just makes perfect sense. Um, but, okay, so in Mario, we have kind of several different power-ups. Now, in Mario, if we're the, the, the big Mario guy, we don't just immediately die when we hit an enemy, do we? Down. Yeah, we scale back down if we were already big. Only if we were little <laughs> you know, do we kick the bucket, right? So now we got to go back and revisit death, all right? So when we come in here to our um, baby... Let's see who handles the floor here. Okay, it looks like the enemy is the one who's killing us. So on trigger enter, if it's the player, we play the one shot um, called impact, and then we. Uh, um, send the message to the baby for the baby to kill itself. All right. Now, it seems like what might make the most sense here is for us to move this logic into the baby and let the baby handle because the baby knows about whether it's currently powered up and things like that. So we'll go ahead and we're going to add the on trigger enter thing into the baby. Now, let's see. Do we have uh, this dude tagged as enemy? We do. He's tagged his enemy. So inside the baby, we'll add on trigger. Uh, I'm not on the baby. Baby movement. So we're going to kind of add our alternate way of dealing with collisions. So this guy's the all collision type stuff, but this guy only fires. In fact, actually, let me... Um, I'll just print something real quick. I just want to make sure this guy doesn't fire 
uh, on a trigger. I don't think it does, but let's just confirm that because it technically is still a collision. So let's see if he notices when he hits the enemy. I'll just have the baby always print out what he hit. Um, actually, just so we don't have a zillion prints, just do an else in here. We'll just print it out in the else. So let's see if the that function knows when the baby hits the enemy. Okay. Yeah, it didn't. The solid object was the death, the death thing below. So um, that function does not know about it. So let's just prove that the other one does. So we'll give the other function in here. So we'll have two different ways of responding to kind of different kinds of collisions. So we're going to say on trigger enter 2D. So now this, uh, um, ooh, this is not going to work. Um, I'm going to go ahead and paste this in here and show it's not going to work. And then I'm going to ask you to tell me why it's not going to work. I'm 99% positive this is not going to work. And I'm going to go ahead and show you the player. Why did this not work? Yeah, the baby doesn't have a trigger. So the trigger that's getting entered is actually the trigger on the enemy. So the enemy at this point is the only guy who actually knows about a trigger. So he can detect when the trigger was entered. Now, from that point forward, he has to... Uh, um, so I guess we can't move the logic completely over to baby. Instead, what we can do is we can let the baby handle what happens. All right, so... Let's go back in here. So we'll take the on trigger enter 2D because that guy will never fire on the baby. But let's go back and look at what happens from the enemy's perspective on that. So the enemy says, if I collided with the player, go ahead and play this uh, uh, this death death scene thing. I think that's the one that has like the explosions and stuff like that. So let's just kill that because that's the sounds that we don't necessarily want to do because we're doing the game over thing or whatever. All right. So now we're sending a message to the baby called kill. All right. So we have a function inside of the baby called kill. So we can think of this like the enemy is trying to kill the baby. Go ahead. Um, can you ask from, from the enemy script? You want to know, can we get the, uh, are, are, are we powered up? Yeah. Um, so what he wants to know is, can we get the is powered up value from the baby here? What do you think? Let's assume I wanted to do that. How would you pull that off? I <laughs> Okay, so if it was public, you'd still need to. Okay, keep going down that line. So I can make it public. Right now it's private, but how do I actually get access to that? So the baby is in the scene, right? Who knows about the baby? How do we access global variables in the scene? How, what is what is our trick been for accessing global variables in the scene? We've had this thing called a scene manager, right? What's the scene manager filled up with? What kinds of variables? We have a scene manager in this one. Oh, have we not done a scene manager in here? Okay. 
So let's assume we wanted to accomplish what you're saying. What I would probably do is I would probably go in here. First of all, it's probably not the way we'd want to do this, but just as an example, I'll go in here. I'm going to create an empty game object in the scene. And we're going to call this, call them whatever you want, but kind of scene manager makes sense. We have this, we have this invisible dude who's kind of in charge of overseeing the stuff in the scene. We can kind of give him access to stuff. So we're going to call him scene manager. All right. But then more important for us, he was just a container to hold a script. All right. That's the more important thing for us here is that we want to have a new script. And actually, you know what? I want to test something here. I don't know. We'll test it here in a second. I think we still need to have him in the scene. So I'm going to create a C sharp script. We're going to call this the scene manager script. And we'll go ahead and attach that to our scene manager. All right, so he has that script. Let's go edit the script. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give him access to the instance of the baby. All right, so we're going to have a public static. We'll call this a well, game object. baby instance. It didn't do the completion stuff again. So I guess just for the sake of whatever, let's double click that again and let it reopen. All right. So we're going to have a static variable. Static variables only exist one time. All right, so now we can say, um, scene manager, give me the instance of the baby. <laughs> okay, now somewhere in here, though, that needs to get set. So the baby can say at start, scene manager, here is me. <laughs> give the scene manager a pointer back to the baby. So in here, and that's why I think we don't, we might not need this in the scene. Um, but I think if you don't put it in the scene, it'll never actually get instantiated. So I think we probably do need it in the scene. One thing we don't need here, though, is this guy, the scene manager. It's really just a container for holding uh, um, objects, right? So it actually isn't a mono behavior. Won't have a start and update. What's the advantage of doing that? Um, I, I think we still need it in the scene. I don't think it'll exist if we don't put it in the scene. Um, I'm going to call it 87% certain. We'll test it. But I do think we do need to in inject it into the scene so it exists uh, during runtime. Um, but the advantage of this is that it's no longer a performance drag, or at least no more than memory. Right. We don't have this guy call an update every single frame or, you know, any of those other things. He just is. He's a container for holding information for us. That makes sense. OK, so and it's important that we make this guy static because we don't want multiple copies of the baby instance. We want to just have a nice little bucket that we can call to. Well, first of all, if it's not static, then in order to access it, we would need an instance of the scene manager class. Well, now it's like, a you know, we have a vicious cycle, you know, in order to get an instance of baby, we need an instance of the C manager class. Well, how do we get an instance of the C manager class? Somebody's going to have to have a static variable at some point uh, in there to make this work. So we're going to have a static variable for baby instance. And then what we'll do is inside of baby movement, because baby movement, this is, as far as we're concerned right now, the dude that knows about the baby, right, knows about that game object. So here in start for this guy, we can say scene manager dot baby instance 
is equal to this dot game object. So we went ahead and set that variable. Now in here, what's it called? Enemy kill script. Now we can ask the question: If scene manager dot baby instance dot is uh, what has what you call the variable? Oh, it's still it's still private. Make that guy public is powered up. Come back into enemy killed. Now we should be able to access the is well. Shortly, we should be able to access the is powered up. Baby movement is powered up. Let me just close this real quick and reopen it. All right, now he knows about it. Some weird update thing, I guess. Well, no, hold on, he doesn't know about it again. Does not contain a... This is part of the script, no. Uh, yes, it is. Since dot, what's it called? Uh, I guess when you said that, I would just give it this instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we do need to give it the script, but then what's the name of the script? So instead of giving it the game object itself, Is it a Unity script? Is that the same? No, that's a. I actually think a a script is a game object. I think it is. So let's go back to baby movement, and rather than baby instance being the game object, let's just set it to this. Okay, it looks like it'll go by the name of it. So this is actually a variable of type baby movement. Now we can set it to uh, this. And then inside of our enemy kill, there's our is powered up. So if is powered up is true, then we'll send, well, if it's not powered up. Okay, so if we're not currently powered up, go ahead and kill. Else, we must be powered up, so then maybe we can send the message to shrink, <laughs> something like that. So collision, oh, let's just steal that line. So there's shrink. Now we need to go write the function for shrinking. Um, just for right now, let's just make sure that our logic is working here. So when the, this is from the enemy kills perspective, if he collides with the player, well, if the, if the player trips his trigger is what it, uh, what it is, then we're gonna ask the question, is the player currently powered up? If he is, uh, well, if he's not currently powered up, that's what this guy right here is. If he's not currently powered up, then tell the player uh, tell the player to kill themselves. Otherwise, we're going to tell the player to shrink. But let's just go ahead and power up the baby. Actually, it's initially not power up the baby, then kill the baby. And then we will power up the baby and then prove the baby doesn't die. Okay. So now we'll go ahead and power up. All right, 
so shouldn't die now. Baby's definitely hitting that trigger, but nothing's happening in that trigger, right? Okay, so now we'll go into the baby. And we'll write a function for shrink. And shrink just says set your scale back to its original. So this dot game object dot, well actually I think we can do it off of uh, just this dot transform dot local scale is equal to a new vector three. This dot initial width, this dot initial height, and one F. So, so we'll restore us to our original size. Probably want to have some sounds associated with this. Whatever the Mario sounds were for getting bigger and getting smaller and that stuff. But all right. Okay. So there's our death. I oh, like actually we respawn, so I didn't have to start over. Uh, do I not actually call the shrink? No, I'm not calling it yet. Perfect. All right, now I'm calling it. <laughs> it's powered up for a very short period of time. This whole movement thing is really bugging me. This baby floats way too much. What's the reality with that? Is he floating so much? Is it his mass? It is mass at three. I said his mass to one. Is it better or worse? Okay, so he jumps super high now. <laughs> All right, there was a lot of hang time there. So let's change it to this mass definitely needs to be bigger. So let's change it to six. So he shouldn't jump very high, but I really wanted to come back down much more quickly. But he's still doing that kind of slide effect thing. So three didn't really seem to be the issue. What if we scale the gravity? Can't get up on the thing anymore. I can't tell. Is he dropping faster? So what if we... So we really want gravity to bring him back down to the, the world. All right. So now we can give him more jump power. It feels more controlled. Let's try 
What's up? Change the value of life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he kind of bumped into the thing. I think <laughs> he didn't. He didn't actually release the uh, power up. He just kind of absorbed it through the rock. <laughs> So I think we uh, we must uh, have the collision box too high for it. Actually, I think that is true, if I remember correctly, for that collision. Well, let's. Uh, I know we have it set where he has to. It's below the bottom part, but I think we maybe have it too high up in the top part. Yeah. Well, at the very least, he's more controllable now. It's an improvement. All right, so let's click on our that's our power up container. There's the actual fire grass. I'm going to edit the box. I just squeezed it down some to hope that he doesn't collide with it now when he's above it. He doesn't. <laughs> we when we did that, we moved it down. Okay. Wait, hold on. It's the container that we're bumping into. So that guy is like that. Maybe initially turn off the collider and tool. Yeah, we could do that. That would probably be the safest. It's actually a pretty good idea. So to not risk this, he wants to keep the collider the size it originally was, or you know, in the same ballpark. And then inside of our power up container, here's our on trigger enter. This is when we're turning the sprite render on. He wants to, at that point in time, say this dot. Um, actually, who has this? This is show power up. All right, so this is when he's turning the sprite render on for the fire grass. So we'll say this dot fire grass dot get component box collider 2D dot enabled is equal to true. So the that dude won't have a box collider enabled until we've hit the container for it to spawn the um, the power up. So when we show the power up, we'll also turn on the box collider for the power up, which means that by default, we need to turn the box collider for the power up off. And we'll do that in Unity. So here is our fire grass. Here is the box collider. Now, one thing that might still happen, though, is did he... Okay, now we're good. Whoa! Yeah, we definitely have way more control. Fly with the enemy. Fly with the enemy? Yeah. I'll die now. Yeah. Oh, I never turned the flag back off. Yeah. I think because, like... Yeah. So what he's saying here in uh, when we tell the baby to shrink, we physically shrunk him, but we never actually said is power up is equal to false. We just made him a smaller, still powered up dude. Um, give it a timer. Maybe wait. 
Also, so you can give some time to move away from the end. Okay, to make him kind of invincible. Yeah. For 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 five seconds. Well, like otherwise, I think it turns false if he dies instantly. He's still in that. He's still. Yeah, I think I think you're right. And is that is that actually how Mario works? I think it might. Doesn't he flash kind of like? Uh, I think he kind of becomes almost translucent for a second where he's he can't be hurt. I think for that same reason. Yeah. So I mean, I'm pretty certain you're going to be right that during that collision. Yeah. So how long do you think it needs to be for him to get away? Seconds or two. All right, so let's make it let's make it three seconds and see if it's too long, where he basically is I- invincible. <laughs> Just make it about seven minutes. <laughs> um, that's kind of the well, sort of kind of the star power. You might remember the the star power up for Mario, but the star power up means anything because he he's not just invincible; he also kills things as he's going right. If you have the, the the star on, if you run through an enemy, the enemy dies. Um, you just don't have to worry about dying unless from fall damage. I think you still fall. Okay, so let's go back in here. Um, how would you implement invincibility? For we're going to do the three seconds thing. How would you go about doing that that approach? You don't need to make him flicker or anything like that. Just how would you make him so that he can't die for three seconds after shrinking? Just time. Okay, so we're we're gonna have a timer. Yeah, hold the hold the screen. Um. Okay. So how? So you want the script to ignore everything, yeah. or at least particularly that, that function will just take three seconds, but then we'll run the second line. Is, does that happen? I'm not sure. Um. Yeah. I don't. Well. Okay. Uh. There is a way to do that to pause the of linear. Uh, yeah, know. I think you can pause the current thread, but I think that will have other negative repercussions. Yeah. So what we really want is we want him to not be killable for three seconds. And then in three seconds, he should be killable again. So just wait to turn his power up to pulse for three seconds. Because he can only kill his power is not on. Yeah, yeah, potentially. So you can you can wait three seconds to actually turn off the power up. You can shrink him, but still have him uh, I guess the the problem with that might be depending on where you put the uh, that logic, because it's still going to call that thing. You might keep resetting your three second timer. Um, so I think maybe having a new variable for is invincible is maybe kind of the the way to handle this. Did you say a while? Can you use a while loop? Oh, like a busy, like a busy wait loop, just to sit there and. Yeah. I don't think you'd want to do that. But that's going to have all sorts of performance issues. Um, so we want to use a timer, you know. So what we'll do is inside of. So in baby movement, let's create another public boolean. Is. Invincible. That's a tough word to spell. I don't like that one. Um, so is invincible. We'll start off as false. So now when we shrink, we're going to go ahead and turn is invincible to true. And then in three seconds, we'll turn it back to false. So here's shrink. There's a function called invoke. Yeah, but we need, in order to invoke, you need to have a function to call. Oh. Yep. Um, Make vincible, is that, is vincible a word? If invincible, that's gotta be. Is that a word? 
Invincible? Invincible is a word that makes you invulnerable. But does that mean that invincible is a word that makes you vulnerable? Is vulnerable. Huh? Is yeah. vulnerable? This is a word. Vin? You know, huh. <laughs> More you know. Make. Vincible. <laughs> That'll confuse people. <laughs> Make vincible. And this will be this dot is invincible is equal to false. Okay, so then in shrink, the very first thing I'm going to do just in case there's a timing thing is I'm going to go ahead and make myself invincible. So very first linear thing I'll do inside of shrink is I'll say this dot is invincible is equal to true with the intention that I cannot be killed right now. Okay, then we'll say invoke name of the function is make invincible over 3.0 f so in three seconds we'll make ourselves vincible again oh i'm going to use that word all day it's a great word i don't like spelling invincible but i like saying vincible just start inserting that into conversations today and see if people look at you like is that a word it's like yes it is um okay so we'll make ourselves vincible in three seconds. So now we need to work off the logic of this. So when we come into our enemy kill, and we've collided with the, uh, the player, we only want to do any of this stuff if the player is currently vincible, right? <laughs> See how it goes there? Yeah, I guess. All right, so if we hit the player, and scene manager dot play baby instance dot is invincible so not that so if the baby is not invincible then we can start doing some killing stuff potential killing stuff right Otherwise, the on trigger entry will be ignored as long as the baby is currently vincible. No, invincible. Be ignored as long as he's currently invincible. Only when he's vincible is. <laughs> yes. All right. And just reviewing here real quick, let's make sure we set the thing up. So then from the baby's perspective, when he shrinks, he marks himself as invincible physically. So that immediately makes that variable true. And then he goes ahead and sets a three second timer for when he becomes invincible again. And then in make invincible is when we set invincible to false. And at that point, he should be killable again. Falls a lot faster now because he's so heavy. Chunky baby. Okay. Looks fair enough, I guess. Um, now, so we have a couple of different types of power ups, right? Because one power up is um, you, uh, well, so let's think about Mario. So in Mario, you have a power up where you're bigger, and what happens is you get smaller. In Mario, you also have a power up where you get the flower thing. You can shoot stuff. Now, if you get hit with that, do you just lose that ability? Yeah. You go step back. Like, so you scale up first after you take mushroom, right? And then no mushroom can spawn again because you're already big. I, well, I, think it can, I think you can get another mushroom. It just doesn't make you any bigger. I think potentially, I mean, the mushrooms are already placed on the scene. I think potentially you can hit multiple mushrooms and they just 
You just wasted it. Don't spawn anymore. Really? Yeah, no spawn clouds. It's the same place as it, I think. We need to play more. I believe it's that the pirates will spawn mushrooms if you don't already have mushrooms, but yeah, they'll swap between which ones show up. And only one will show up. Okay, so you're saying that the the power up box, the container, uh, it, when you come up to it, if you're tiny, you will turn into it'll be a mushroom. But if you're tall, it'll be a flower, which is that's what you're saying, right? Really, I'm, I'm kind of think I thought that tiny Mario could shoot fire. Is that not a thing? I kind of recall tiny Mario being able to shoot fire. Uh, Really? <laughs> everybody, everybody, <laughs> open up your Mario Bible. <laughs> Luigi's letter to the princess. <laughs> Did Luigi actually have a name in the first one? Was he already a Luigi? Why do they call it Mario Brothers? Because Mario was the dude's first name. Right? His last name's Mario. His last name's Mario too? Yeah. Are you sure? Well, or are you just you're just applying some logic there? <laughs> you're saying his last name must be Mario. They made some movie and I did not watch the whole movie, but that was important. I remember the movie, and I think I did see the whole thing. So somebody did that to their kid. It's a, it's a game character. No, somebody did that. <laughs> that happened. Um, okay. Uh, so then we need a... So, okay, so have we... Let, let's say we've concluded enough to say that it does alternate, that a, a power-up container will never give you a mushroom when you already are big. It will always give you a other thing, <laughs> something else, something other than a mushroom um, uh, that will make you be able to shoot stuff. All right, so we have kind of two different power-ups there, right? Make yourself big and then make yourself shoot stuff. Okay, so with that in mind, um, we need to change our logic now on our power-up container because our power-up container can actually uh, raise two different types of power-ups, right? It can raise a power-up that is a uh, make-you-bigger power-up. It could also raise a power-up of make-you-shoot-stuff power-up. Okay, so let's start off with the type of power-up it uh, releases. Um, what we'll probably need to do is have a second. We'll... we'll we already have a um, prefab for this, right? Oh, we don't. We're going to need a prefab for our power-up container. Um, so just so I don't forget that, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to drag my power-up container down here give, to give myself a prefab. We're actually going to update it up here, and then we'll apply it to the, uh, uh, the prefab. Um, but if I want my power-up container to be able to uh, send two different types of uh, power-ups depending on the current situation. Um, what's the first thing I'm going to need to be able to do? Flag. Well, I'm going to need a flag logic-wise, but I'm going to need two separate power-ups, right? So right now I have this fire grass power-up. I have this dude. Uh, and I'll go ahead and turn the render on just so we can see it. So there's our fire grass power-up. So now... This is an interesting. The fire grass probably should be the one that turned me to fire stuff, but that's not the way it works in the baby world. Um, all right. So now what we need to do, and that guy's 1.5 by 1.5. We need to give ourselves a second type of power up. What's that thing? Oh. That works. That's yeah. So that's when the baby throws rocks. <laughs> that's that's what this baby does. That's perfect. All right. So we'll go ahead and drag that in here in the power up container. Call this rock. Uh, 
All right, and I'm going to set its uh, scale and everything to the same as the uh, fire grass. This will be zero, zero, 1 1.5, 1 1.5. And then I'm gonna turn off the sprite render on the fire grass. Do we still see our rock? I scaled it to 1.5. It appears to be, well, he's too big to begin with. Put his order and layer to one. Okay. So that's our rock. So now we need to have our um, the power up container script know about firegrass or rock, right? She already knows about the firegrass. So now we'll have a public game object rock. Here's our power container. We'll let him know about the rock. Okay. And for right now, just to test this. And actually, before we forget, just for the moment, let's make our rock tagged as a power up. And then for show power up, instead of fire grass, we're going to have it show rock. But we'll still have it go to the fire grass destination. That just happened to be our placeholder for where it was going to go to. Um, and then for right now, we're going to go ahead and we're going to put the, uh, well, I'll leave that off for a second. That's not going to hurt anything. Just comment it. So that's when we actually enabled the script because we didn't want the, uh, uh, remember the firegrass script made the guy start moving. So um, actually what we can do is we can do this. We'll tell our rock to go ahead and turn his firegrass script on. That's the script that makes it move. So then we'll go ahead and go out to Unity here, and we're going to add the firegrass script to our rock. And all that script says is tells him to start moving at a speed, and then he also knows. Um, what to happen, what to do when he hits a, a solid object to go back the other direction. So that's just a movement script. We just happen to call it firegrass. All right. And then I'll go ahead and turn the sprite render off of the rock and I'll turn the firegrass off the rock. So now when the baby hits this guy. <laughs> Yeah. 
that guy. Power up container. We should show the rock. Game object rock. Turn the sprite render on. Box collider on. Move it to the destination. Ooh, I would have thought that should work. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, okay, well, so we'll write the logic for flipping back and forth. I'm just probably something stupid why that's not doing it. Um, I won't give you a break. I won't give you a homework assignment over break. So uh, I guess I'll see everybody on Tuesday.